and we're back. <laughs> so, um, you know, we were having a conversation and, you know, each of you have really elevated some of the ways that you're thinking about education, educators, school settings, and the ways that we can engage students and instructors and staff um, in, in, meaningful, in meaningful ways. Um, I'm, I'm curious, as we think about some of the challenges there, whether it's funding for schools, teacher pensions, general investments in education, and as you've mentioned, you know, there is now this rabid uh, straw man uh, argument happening at state legislature levels as it relates to critical race theory. Some states are, are uh, some state legislatures are banning the use of social emotional learning terms uh, uh, in their school systems. And so, so you, you know, you think about these practical daily challenges, these legislative policy challenges that are uh, affecting education. I'm wondering uh, how can we also utilize counter narratives to support educators who are making difficult decisions about telling the truth in their classrooms? And I'll, anyone who'd like to start with that can please feel free. Well, Rupert, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> now, why well, don't you start? <laughs> why don't you start? Fair enough, fair enough. Um, so what's, what's interesting to me uh, as we think about, let's take the attacks on critical race theory in particular, what we know is that this isn't something that, that kids are learning in K through 12. Um, this is an opportunistic um, method to really sort of shape narrative, to shape the kind of beliefs that uh, parents have in terms of what's happening in the classroom, what level of indoctrination uh, may or may not be taking place. Um, uh, a part of that also is uh, the degree to which uh, schools have some level of independence, autonomy, and support around uh, to the point that, Mary Evan, that you made to teach uh, a an accurate history of our country in a way that positions young people to make different decisions. And so uh, there's a, but for me, right, th there's a very real struggle for instructors, for teachers who are saying, I want to do the right thing but I'm afraid of losing my job. I'm afraid of some of the pushback. I'm afraid of some of the, the very real consequences that can occur if I do so. And uh, in a state like Kentucky, where we're already going in that direction of, towards critical race theory, um, uh, I think it certainly puts educators in a tough spot. So if we're going to be in a position to influence the policy decisions that are creating these barriers and, and and to shift those towards creating opportunities, there's got to be a generative narrative process in place. And so to push back to you all, the question is, what, what can or should that generative narrative process look like? Um, and you know, what, what recommendations do you have for a state like Kentucky? Well, j just to say a few things um, relevant to this. Uh, uh, the, um, the language that we choose, the language that we use to talk about what we do with educators, I think needs to be very carefully um, crafted and carefully chosen. Uh, I think most educators, uh, legislators, and parents would agree that they want their children to uh, um, be happy, they want their children to be successful, they want their children to lead meaningful lives, uh, they want their children to um, be uh, good at regulating their emotions. Uh, uh, there are ways, I think, that we can frame at least some of this uh, in language that is uh, really going to be part of a different narrative. And one of the things that I wanna underscore is that one of the great failures, I think, of modern education is that we do not educate attention in our children. William James in 1890 published a two-volume tome called The Principles of Psychology, and he has a whole chapter on attention in this book, and he said, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. And he went on to say that in education, 
which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. The fact that we do not educate attention in our children is, I think, nothing short of a moral failing. And if we had kids who actually had rudders of their mind, if you will, uh, so that they can regulate their attention, they can actually resist the kind of capture that occurs with the narratives that are, that are uh, often dominant in our culture, narratives of fear, for example. Uh, and uh, I think that there's a lot that can be gained, and I think most educators, parents, legislators would agree that we want our children who, who are good at being able to self-regulate, that this is a skill that can be trained, can be educated, and this is a skill that research actually shows quite robustly predicts life success. Uh, and so uh, I think that if we had children, the, the, not educating attention, the, the metaphor is like having a sailboat that is in the middle of a turbulent ocean without a rudder. That's the nature of the situation today. And attention can provide that kind of rudder and help children to intentionally regulate their own minds rather than having their minds hijacked by the media uh, and the narratives which are so fear-based in our culture today. And I think that's terrific. I think as well, you know, as a, as a young person, I was absolutely captivated by biographies, right? Reading people's stories. So we take the attention, but we bring it to stories that make these movements alive. So critical race theory is gonna be, you know, the provenance of academia and other intellectuals who want it make these changes, and those are absolutely necessary, but they're not sufficient, and they often get us caught up in, you know, unfortunate arguments that don't necessarily move forward for education in our school systems. So I think we've got to not just tell the story from theory, but back to your point of practice and so on. I mean, the story of Rosa Parks, the story of John Lewis, this, these are amazing stories. Um, the stories of the suffragettes and standing out in front of the Wilson White House and having things thrown at them and so on, and yet they persisted. What we all want to feel and understand and sustain is action against all odds, resilience of the human spirit despite everything. And we want to get up not just angry, but somehow hopeful that change can happen and filled with gratitude that we can participate in. And that's what historical biographies give us, among many things, inspiration. Yeah, and one thing to just point out to follow on that, one of the things I always um, remind myself of and others is when Martin Luther King gave his famous speech, the title was not, I Have a Nightmare. Yeah. And I think having a dream of a different way of being, a different uh, narrative, uh, is really so essential for the kind of inspiration and hope that you describe. Yeah. And I, I do think Native American life ways and cultures are now being reappreciated and understood and uh, lifted up. There's other ways of knowing. And again, through the biography, I mean, Crazy Horse, these incredible leaders, what they endured but how that culture is also infusing our ways of knowing, traditional environmental knowledge, scientific knowledge, and so on. These are, we like to think we're ninja at a place like Yale, which is so bureaucratic and so on, but if you find those openings, I think we can make this happen over time. Midwife um, it. Could I, I'd like to also circle back to Rashad's original question. <laughs> Uh, Rashad, I have a, a tactical suggestion for you. You want to know what can you do in a situation where something like critical race theory is under such attack. And the advice comes from martial arts, from Aikido. You know, if you attack an Aikido master, he'll move. He, 
where, where you're putting all your energy of attack isn't going to do a thing because he's not there anymore. He's doing something else. And that something else in a school setting could be something that Richie alluded to, which is skill building, which is teaching procedural knowledge. There's a, uh, not just um, honing attention and concentration ability. There's another exercise for attention called uh, expanding the circle of caring, yeah. which I think is very relevant to, to the bias question because as you expand the circle of people you actually care about uh, and you see that everyone should be cared about, it's in effect teaching kids, you know, there's no room for bias in this. Just a thought. Well, I, I'm really interested in, you know, we, we, you know, Mary Evelyn, you talked about this, um, this sort of sometimes uh, amorphous American dream idea um, but also, it's an atomizing narrative, isn't it? It's an individualizing narrative. It's a rugged individualism narrative. It's a take and conquer narrative. How do we, and so, you know, and Daniel, how do we hold these things of this very powerful narrative? Someone said what, that someone once said Americans are a group of temporarily embarrassed millionaires, right? It's like, we're all sort of gonna be the next Elon Musk, I suppose, but it, it makes me, how do, how do we, how do we imbue some of this more collective ideas, this collective narrative in spaces and places where we're very much um, rewarded for a sense of individualism and it's incentivized? Uh, one thing that's really interesting to me, uh, and Rashad, you do a lot of work in organizations, is that many, many organizations are now looking beyond the individual you know, you, can, you could be narcissistic. You could be a leader who only cares about yourself. What organizations are saying is, you know, we need people uh, who care about the team level, who care about the group, who care about, for example, that sense of belonging. Uh, and I think valuing that is really important. MIT, for example, is now teaching uh, its kids, its students rather, uh, not to be just about themselves when they enter a company, but to think about the common good, the greater good. What is it that they're becoming part of and what kind of team are they becoming part of? I think we need a narrative that's more along those lines. Yeah, and just to amplify on that, um, we have developed a curriculum that we call the kindness curriculum for preschool children. Uh, and it is a curriculum that combines both declarative and procedural learning and really emphasizes the procedural part. Uh, it's been tested scientifically. There's publications, uh, randomized controlled trials, uh, showing the benefit. But one of the really interesting um, observations that we've made is that at least in American classrooms, the kindness curriculum actually doesn't um, make the kids more kind over the course of the school year, but it prevents the kids from becoming more selfish. Uh, and it turns out that the average American child over the, starts out preschool showing spontaneous high levels of kindness. And those spontaneous high levels of kindness diminish over the course of the preschool period. And, uh, 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 and so this is, uh, I think, a reflection of the cultural narrative that you're describing, Rashad. Uh, but we can counter it with these simple educational programs and strengthen what is really an innate quality, which is kindness. Uh, and so it doesn't take much, but we need to be proactive because uh, I think the very future of humanity as we know it depends upon it. Absolutely. I mean, I like to say there's no future without a shared future. That's where we are as almost 8 billion people. And it doesn't take a lot to say, if you break your wrists, you can't solve that yourself. <laughs> and you know, the kindness that I had at Yale New Haven Hospital and people everywhere, that instinct that Richie said over and over again is absolutely there. People pushing me through the airport in the wheelchair. 
But what I want to say is our society, this is where I'm saying life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. You know, the, the hyper-individualism, my way or the highway, um, that has led to massive guns across the country, the rights of the individual, not the rights of the collective, not the rights of nature, not the rights of future generations. That has all been blown out of the water. Europe has a far greater sense of this. But what was so powerful to me in going to Japan in the uh, early 70s, actually, was seeing a society that actually has these reciprocities, has these ways of relating to people, has uh, elements of cultivation from Confucianism and other traditions that says you cultivate yourself not for personal salvation or for even enlightenment. You cultivate yourself for the common good. That's what Confucianism is about. And that tradition has affected more people on the planet than any other tradition because of its antiquity, 6,000 years, because of numbers of people. And so what I like to say is we need healthy individualism. We need creativity. People love entrepreneurship and creativity here. That's fantastic. And creativity in the arts. People come to New York and San Francisco, LA for that creativity. But we also need to cultivate commonalities in the plural, a, a sense of a shared city, society, and so on. When I taught Confucianism for many years, I would say, you cannot play sports team sports without a team. And that's part of, it's in our society. We have to lift up the examples which make it clear that team making leads to exciting interactions and so on. So the common good as well as healthy individuals, it's a new yin yang, it's a new synergy. And that's why we need other cultures to infuse our way forward for sure. And even in practices that, that can be done individually or collectively, for example, if a person is engaged in physical exercise to uh, help themselves become more healthy, uh, a simple shift in mindset where they can invoke the intention that I'm becoming more healthy, getting myself in shape, not just for myself, but so that I can be of benefit to my family. I can be of benefit to uh, the uh, people I work with. I can be of benefit to my community. That simple shift in mindset can produce enormous beneficial consequences that we've measured scientifically just with this simple mindset shift. Uh, and so it, it again, uh, it doesn't take much if we remind people about this different mode of being, this different narrative, uh, uh, we can, I think, really see uh, and taste the benefits very, very quickly. And I want to say, you know, generosity, compassion, American society has it to be evoked even more. We understand philanthropy, and Louisville's a huge example, but the philanthropic mindset in this country, when a disaster happens, people are there. The floods in Kentucky, et cetera, the eon, uh, the hurricane. People do want to help. How that is evoked with a sense of compassion, reciprocity, generosity, it's a yet fully untapped potential. And that's part of the reversal. We want to be helpful to people, especially those in need. And I think that kind of stuff which you're um, drawing attention to is absolutely true and it's happening all the time and it's, we, we simply um, need to take the time and notice that it's actually absolutely. happening. Yeah, I mean, I say it because I was part of a project on philanthropy out of the University of Indiana. They asked me to write about Confucianism. Well, Confucianism relies on the state to take care of everything. But we have a private sector. We have this creative energy that can be pulled forward. That's all I'm saying. And we have great examples of doing it. So Asian societies are coming here to learn how to do philanthropy, you see, because it's not built into their DNA like it is here. I think there's, uh, as a reformed journalist, I have to make a confession, uh, which is that uh, what, what makes headlines is what's upsetting to people. 
If yeah. you actually looked at all of the acts of kindness and yeah. compassion and caring that occur every day, the small yeah. acts yeah. among families, among friends and communities, it, and you put that on one side of a scale and then you put the things that make headlines, the horrible stuff on the other, the acts of goodness would far outweigh the acts of badness. I, just something that we need to correct, I think, in the narratives yeah. that we hear and tell each other. And Yes Magazine out of Seattle does that. They give the positive stories. And there are other news outlets for that. We need that, Dan. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering if we can continue on this idea of interdependence as a vehicle for some of the uh, social outcomes that, that we're seeking. And, you know, uh, how can we continue to leverage this idea of connection, of necessary connection, as a method for justice? And so, you know, we talk about natural disasters often. Here in Kentucky, we had, uh, we had recently tornadoes, we had floods in Eastern Kentucky. There was a lot of outpouring of compassion and help for our, for our neighbors in Eastern Kentucky. Um, certainly, you mentioned the murder of Breonna Taylor. There was a major civil rights mobilization across the state. And, and yet, uh, in Louisville, uh, certainly we have a police department that harasses and oppresses black and brown communities every day. Certainly in Eastern Kentucky, they're dealing with toxic uh, groundwater and, and the, the horrors of mountaintop removal um, generationally. And, and so in, in what ways, what are our opportunities to uh, think about that, that, the nature of interdependence in ways that collectively we can say, the daily injustices happening in our city are not okay. The daily injustices, the generational injustices happening in our city are not okay. They're not okay in Eastern Kentucky. And in what ways can that connection between people across, across a state like ours, how can we leverage that to, to push for real justice, real economic justice, real environmental justice? What are our opportunities? Well, I, I, I would, um, I mean, I think those are all, you know, extremely important challenges and I don't really think any of us have the answers. Uh, um, but I do think that um, the very same mechanisms that result in us not paying attention to the good things of, that Dan was describing, the many acts of kindness that are replete in um, most people's everyday life, um, those same mechanisms are at play in us being blind to, uh, uh, to the kinds of issues that you're talking about also, Rashid. Um, and so I think that uh, um, we need a kind of awakening of awareness uh, so that we can be, so that the aperture of awareness can be much more expanded and we can uh, actually uh, um, uh, uh, pay attention to and be bothered by, allow ourselves to be bothered by these injustices that you're describing. Um, uh, uh, our attention is, can be so pulled uh, and we're so distracted. We talk about a fiscal deficit in this country. In my view, the attention deficit in this country far exceeds the fiscal deficit. Uh, yet there are ways, I think, to, to help this. Uh, and I think that, that we really do need to focus a lot on this next generation who I think we, we really can educate in a different way and um, will be a voice for a very different narrative. Dan, do you have? So I think that the interconnection, I, I think that the social injustice and the environmental crisis are actually interwoven. Uh, if you look at, uh, for example, the cost of pollution of toxic chemicals, it, uh, far more impacts people of color, for example. Uh, and so by correcting or facing or making transparent and acting on uh, setting it right for the environment, I think we also would have to speak to the, uh, the built-in social injustice that goes hand in hand. Yeah. yeah, 
I think you are asking one of the key questions across the country, right? How do we bring different ethnic groups together, different causes together? And I do think what Dan just said and, and uh, um, Richie in his own wonderful way. Um, I think this, the social justice and environmental justice is the key weaver. Um, and that's what we're seeing at Yale. This fall, there were two huge conferences on environmental justice. One was African American and African justice, bringing Ken Sarawiwa's daughter from the Delta uh, in Nigeria, where he, 25 years ago, was hanged because of his you know, protests against Shell and so on. You've got environmental leaders in the Amazon, indigenous people who the human rights are being abused all the time. That is being brought into focus and so on. We've helped at Trinity, my, my college in Washington, environmental justice program, because the whole school now is educating inner city African American and Latina women. And it's powerful and people are really supporting that. And I think there's one example that brings this together in a way that it was very hopeful, even though the outcome wasn't. And that's the Standing Rock um, event in North Dakota with Hunk Papa Sioux, who came, it came from the youth of their tribe to say, we are going to have a fire. We are going to make this a sense of sacredness of land and water. They had runners all the way to Washington, DC, of the youth group. But that gathering that, as you know, expanded across to, to be the largest gathering of indigenous peoples in modern history from Latin America and so on, but also African Americans came out there. Cornell West was out there saying, we have solidarity of our African American communities with, with you protesting the sacredness of water and the pipeline going under the Missouri River. Um, we had such solidarity, veterans came, you know, and, and veterans uh, were asking for forgiveness and so on in this context. So we are going to be creating solidarities, rituals of forgiveness, new beginnings, and that example, I think, will be a great inspiration going forward of Standing Rock, um, of those new alliances that we're drawing together. So, I got carried away, and I realized we are over time. <laughs> so let, let me thank uh, each of you for your time tonight. Uh, Daniel, Richie, Mary Evelyn, thank you so much. It was an uh, honor sharing space with you. Thank you.